Hey, it's good to be here. I'm so grateful to have the, the invitation to talk with you all today. And I hope that we can have a robust conversation. I'm very excited to engage it's like we have, you know, participants from all over the state of New York and different settings. And we feel like this topic is timely. And, you know, I want to jump right in, but I also want to encourage you to interrupt me with this many people in the Zoom room. I'm going to default sometimes to, to talking, but I want to hear what you have to say. I think that, that your stories are probably the most important and informative aspect of this, this type of webinar training. So please jump in. Uh, before we do that, though, I wanted to bring you greetings. I am in Birmingham, just south of the city. Um, at a public liberal arts college. And so we bring you greetings from, from the warm, hot and humid South and just welcome everyone. And again, please chat in. I wanna know what you have to say. I wanna know what your struggles are. Uh, part of the, the work around this webinar is helping us, you know, sort of from my perspective, understand what it's like to be in the day-to-day -day workforce of a social worker, how our work has changed post pandemic what types of measures you're doing to take care of yourselves and your families as you navigate the difficulty of day-to-day of -day life in our profession. And I'm very interested um, in the impact factor of going back to work after such a difficult sort of two years in terms of navigating our social problems and you know what specific challenges you're encountering. So if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll move over. I do mute my, my tile or put you on um, my profile pic as I'm talking, but I'll come back into the room and uh, regularly and, and engage the audience. So the title of the presentation just, just simply comes from, from my work around professional resilience and how, you know, sort of the, the impetus for this work really came from my from my early years as a child welfare worker in our state and thinking about and, and watching really good, strong, healthy social workers, you know, have challenges with the work and maybe, you know, feel like they had feelings of wanting to leave the work at times and not really understanding why that's not going to serve the clients and how that's going to impact the people that were challenged to serve. And, you know, I really became fascinated around hearing the stories about professional practice. And I became fascinated about, you know, what keeps those individuals who, who stay in the profession here as long as they do, um, keeping them sort of engaged in the work and keeping themselves whole while they do that. So, you know, my objectives for today are just to help you conceptualize what self-care is. It's a really poorly defined variable. Uh, there's a lot of gray area around that. It's not an intellectual issue. I think intellectually, all of us understand, you know, maybe some idea of what self-care is. Maybe you've gotten some training on, on the, you know, the concept or the construct of self-care. But in terms of what that really looks like in the practical world and how you can take this term that we've trained so much on and turn it into something tangible that you can really use, that's really where there's been a gap uh, in the research. And I tend to default to words like professional resilience and growth. Um, I feel like there's there's been a heavy narrative, particularly within the profession of social work around the risk of burning out, about having a traumatized workforce. And, and I'll talk to you a little bit about why that narrative has been threaded uh, so pervasively kind of throughout our profession over the last 10 to 20 years. We've got enough research. We don't even need to do research anymore around the fact that these things exist. What we don't have good research on is, is what to do. So we've kind of trained you guys, at least in our state, I say we've, we've trained y'all to death on what burnout is. We haven't really done a good job training around solutions. You know, how can, can you address burnout uh, before you actually need to leave the organization? And where does trauma fall within that? Because burnout and sort of having a, a trauma experience are very different. And then as we talk about self-care, you know, on the end of the webinar, I'm gonna ask you guys to come into the chat and be a little bit more active around what strategies you're utilizing daily. 
uh, to take care of yourselves and to take care of your families and all the other people who depend on you, your pets and, and everything else that has a stake in your health and well-being. So there's a bit of an, an, a challenge there uh, for you to turn the prism inward just a little bit, use those strong social work skills and really look at what you can do uh, to take care of yourself as you continue to do this really difficult work. So there's been some shifts. And so, I mean, this is not a new conversation and this may be, this is kind of a fun place for me to, you know, go into the room. And so if you guys will watch the chat, you can almost date yourself in terms. So I'd love to see the participants if you, if you wanna raise your hand. And how many of you all in the room were trained? Oh, I can't see the full room. So how many of you all were trained around burnout? How many of you have in your history as a social worker had burnout trainings? Has someone been to your age? I see the hands going up now. It's ticking like the stock market. <laughs> That's awesome. So, okay. so one of the major shifts, so if you'll just watch that for me, Kara, and yeah. kind of pull yeah. me out, I'll go back to share. So we know that when we work with clients who are suffering in some way that there's an exchange of human energy. And you can trace that all the way back to the Freudian literature um, you know, in terms of counter-transference, you know, projective identification. This, is, this has been a part of the conversation around what it's like to really engage someone who's suffering in some way um, for many, many years. In the 1970s and early 1980s is really when the conversation around burnout began to start. And Frudenberger, who was a sociologist, really researched this concept in human service workers. And sociology, I work in a college of behavioral and social sciences. So I always like to frame up social work as you know, sociology theory when it actually meets the ground. We actually go out and help people. Um, instead of talk about, you know, sociological theory, social workers go out and apply this work. And Frudenberger identified in human service work and, you know, not to quote his work directly, but he said, you know, eager young minds, the social workers of the world going out into their organizations and then leaving um, because they figure out at some point that, you know, their idealistic nature is not going to, to do the work. Um, which I think is is negative. And, and he brought that term burnout into our dialogue as a profession. And so anyone who was trained within, you know, sort of in that time frame, I feel like where we are at this point is we burned you guys out, training you on burnout. And then there was a second way where we traumatized everyone by telling them they were going to be traumatized by their work. And I'm not saying in any way that it's not possible for either one of these things to happen. But what I am saying, if you look at this data really closely, during these time periods, there's an overrepresentation of these constructs. And min much of that data was collected from human service workers, whatever their capacity was, who either identified as being burned out or who identified in some way as being traumatized by their work. So, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of, you know, research knowledge to understand if you're only measuring people who leave, there's going to be an overrepresentation of those constructs in the data. So, you know, in real, you know, what I say real talk, what that means is I feel like we've conditioned ourselves as a profession in some ways to think that this happens more often than what it actually does and how I entertained that. So that was really what the idea was. So I started to think about, all right, so how can we look at this a little more closely in terms of resilience? And I realized that there was over 20 years of research that we were all consuming, suggesting that the rates of these of burnout and compassion fatigue and secondary trauma are high. No one asked the people who stayed. So it is a standard research rule, if you're gonna report results, that you should have a healthy control. There was very little data on those of us who have just stayed. So I said, well, why are we not talking to the, you know, the 25-year veterans? Why are we not talking to the agency directors? Why are we not talking to the people who've moved through different areas of social work practice in their career and simply asking them what has kept them in the profession for this long? 
And that's really where we got, where I got, you know, to, you know, that's kind of the short version of that. And this is a timeline. So you can almost plot yourself there on the timeline and see what kind of training you got. And it really was, I was trained in the late 1990s. So much around the trauma literature. That's when the, you know, the secondary traumatic stress construct, compassion fatigue construct, vicarious traumatization construct, we're all beginning to reveal themselves in the literature. And it really has been more recently that we started to move, particularly in trauma work, that we started to move the narrative a little bit. The needle's been kind of moving on the record around resilience. And if you're, if you're a trauma professional, what that means is we're starting to hear more stories now, not just about how terrible the trauma was, but how people got better. And that's really part of the resilience construct. Resilience literally is how people get better, how they can bounce back. So I'm going to stop share for just a minute. And I planted a little chat here. So if you guys will help me, Kara and Ki Kiara, if you'll help me kind of look at that, what does resilience mean to you? So Kara, if I say, you know, could you describe to me, and it doesn't have to be a social worker, resilience is the person in your life that you know has suffered some great tragedy. It could be a parent, it could be a relative, and you sort of stand back from that person and go, how in the world did you get through this? And how are you still okay? That to me is sort of the conversation. So looking at the chat, when- so, Yeah, let's see if what people say in the chat. We were chatting about burnout and I asked how many of, of the people know people who are burnout. And everybody said so many, my whole so office, many. myself included, um, everywhere I turn, people are burnout. Uh, do you think somebody just asked about being jaded? Um, uh, those who stay, are they, do they become jaded? I said, I think jaded is often an indication of burnout. So we are having this side chat about burnout. I just wanted you to know um, uh, when, when you started talking about burnout. So, um, but let's switch gears to resilience. What does resilience um, mean for you all? And Christy is chatting in the ability to be flexible and to not internalize experiences. Okay, so having some, you know, we're use, if we use the contemporary language, there's an emotional bandwidth there. There's a flexibility. So it's actually almost, almost like a rubber band. Can you, you know, how, how much dexterity are you going to have and how far is your emotional reach? And the internalization, that variable that tends to show up in our younger, more inexperienced social workers. So the data suggests the longer we're in the work, it takes our central nervous system a while to acclimate itself, to teach it, you know, that, that clients are going to sometimes not get better and that's not on you. You're doing your job and you're working hard. But newer, younger, inexperienced social workers who have less training they kind of go in, I don't want to point back to Frudenberger, but sometimes they go in with expectations. And part of that's our fault in the academy. And I think all of us have felt that. There's such a big difference in Dr. Newell talking about there are this many sexually abused children in our state than sending a student for the first time into an organization where those numbers are real. Where they have to have a real, you know, real time live conversation with a child that suffered in some way. So it takes a while for the augmentation of the central nervous system to hit that gear and go, you know, all that data we talk about, those are actually, it's really safe to talk about things in terms of data because data is not real, but humans are. And, and that, you know, for our younger folks, I think they don't realize that it takes time to adjust. And they sort of may say, well, I'm burning out. I always feel burnout. If you're going to call someone to burn out, you have to actually be in the profession for a minute. You know, don't come home from your field placement. Dr. Newell, you're right. You know, I feel burned out already. Now you got to be in social work a while before you can show up. For the people who chatted in and said they felt their whole office was burned out, that doesn't surprise me at all, given the amount of work we've been asked to do, um, the kind of pay that social workers sometimes get for the work that we're asked to do, uh, the tasks that are involved, including on call. And I always point back, and I, I don't think intellectually anyone in this room doesn't understand that's the roadmap to burnout. What we haven't done a good job around is teaching everyone in that office how to cope with that stress. Is there something we can actually do about this? Is there a way that we can regulate 
and getting our organizational directors to buy into the importance of that, right? It's important, I mean, if we want to charge our profession as caregivers, as social workers, we have to also charge ourselves with taking care of each other within that process. And burning out, for me, the representation of that doesn't mean that, you know, if you leave this organization, you're burned out. It may mean that you leave one position or one post as a social worker and go on to a different post and still stay in the profession. What, what I don't like and what I get really, you know, what disenchants me is people who engage social work and then leave and think there's nowhere else. They leave our profession altogether. That creates a real crunch because it's the rest of us who have to stick around and do the work. And every time someone leaves an agency, it would they leave all the clients. It's not like when you leave the building and that workload falls on to the next person. And organizations can get in ruts around that. And that really does look like a burned out organization. And when I talk to practice audiences, that conversation sounds really familiar to them, right? And so I always focus on, well, let's keep all the folks we have here healthy and let's do the best we can. It costs our organizations a lot of money to hire and rehire and retrain if we're not going to continue to have a workforce that thrives. And that is a really heavy charge. That is no small task. And we haven't done a good job with that um, in taking care of our social workers. And some of that, Kara pointed out too, is the value that's placed on our profession in some ways. Um, you know, in the business world, if Google can do this and, you know, these bigger organizations understand that taking care of their workforce is important, we can do that too. Some of these definitions of resilience are really incredible. I'm just going to read a few. Come on. And thank you for your thoughts. It was really helpful. Um, Resilience is coping during difficult circumstances and still persevere. Um, the state of bouncing back to keep going, uh, hardiness in our psyche, having some outlet and distance from the pain or discomfort. And then we did have somebody that said, um, we did have, where did you go, Annie? I think about resilience in a negative way. I grew up in the Midwest and it's the word people use when they want you to shake it off, quote unquote. And a few people uh, could identify with that. Absolutely. I'm in the South. And so, you know, that's kind of our motto here is, is shake it off. And, you know, if you're in shaking it off could be a form of resilience. I get that. But the tone of no matter how difficult it is, you know, there's a leveling there. Some incidents you can just shake off and move forward. That's just a good point. But also if it levels up the expectation that no matter how difficult the situation is, you should just shed that and move on without dedicating any time or intention to, to you know, addressing those feelings, that contributes to the burnout process. And if over time, there's a psychological pileup that can happen with that, that shake it off attitude. And that can lead to desensitization from the work because if you don't do the work, your central nervous system will do it for you. So burnout, you know, one of the key indicators, if you really look at it closely, is becoming desensitized to the work altogether or to the clients. And for me, it, that's when you start to lose spirit for the work, you know, where you start to desensitize, you lose meaning behind the work that we do. And that is really when people will say they start to turn the corner. You know, this is where I'm really considering, you know, leaving this agency or this position. This is what burnout feels like for me, you know, because I don't feel like the spirit, you know, and the value and the mission of our profession exists in the same way that it did when I started. And so alternatively, if you look at, I'm going to go back to share, Kara, if that's all right with you. So if we look at this, you yeah. know, this word, this construct, it's actually really poorly defined. And this is a big slide. So I'm going to do this in, in short time. Um, so Webster sort of talks about this idea of a resilient person as being strong, being healthy, you know, having the ability to, to bounce back or recover psychological resilience, sort of looking at how you adapt in the face of tragedy or trauma, how you engage you know, family and relationships when you're in the presence of, of difficult or hard times. If you did a sort of a word comparison, you might see resilience paired with 
um, that chat comment is right on with quality, human qualities like being hardy, um, having you know the ability to weather the storm, depending. I like that Midwestern attitude um, that's very familiar to me um, of weathering the storm, you know, just put your head down, keep moving forward. Um, when I started to study this, it actually was a poorly defined variable because it was all over the place and it kind of depended on who you were talking to. So if I were talking to a medical doctor, they would talk about someone who was physically resilient. You know, their body could, you know, um, you know have immunity and could bounce back from a mental Ill a medical illness or a surgery. You know, therapists, we sort of think about the emotional agility of the human being. You know, how much stress can we tolerate? Um, whether it's work related or family related or personal stress, how much stress can we absorb into our own psyches without, you know, needing to default to a service provider or ask for help in some way. Um, and then for me, I sort of use a multidimensional approach. This is sort of how I think of this is it's what we learn from the hard time. So when I say, if you're thinking about resilience and you don't, you don't need a, you know, social work dictionary version of this in your head. What you need is to think about that, that person that you know and have that respect for that's bounced back from human tragedy. It can be a client, it can be a relative, and the idea of how they made it through those circumstances. And as a young professional, I remember thinking, you know, watching clients, you know, as a practitioner bounce back from such hard lives and being fascinated with the study of that. Almost like, how can I study that? How can I measure that? And what does that really look like? And in terms of professional resilience, when I talk about the, the construct of professional resilience, that's just how we are able to in our daily lives as social workers, provide a service to someone who's poor, vulnerable, suffering in some way, how we're able to deliver that service and thrive within those conditions such that the clients are getting the care that they need while in the same space as individual social workers or as teams of professionals or providing care individually or collectively in terms of peer support in the organization. And some of the outcomes that we've been able to gather from organizations that have embraced this type of philosophy is that we're able to actually, it's almost like you have a, you know, a deflating effect. So we're really wanting to inflate social workers spirit and value for the mission of our work to help them recenter around why we're all in this profession to begin with, which is to provide quality service to those who are in need, but also foster compassion, satisfaction, and resilience in our workforce. And that goes back to, to meaningful work. And it's really hard when you're in the meta of a burned out organization to remember why we're in the business to begin with. You know, why do we choose self-select into the profession of social work? And certainly we don't want our for me as a college professor and my new students, but our people in the workforce to be damaged in some way by the very reasons they got here to begin with, if that makes sense. And there needs to be an adjustment there. So the third sort of, you know, overarching part of this is self-care, which has become, in my mind, self-care and mindfulness have become very overused terms. Um, everyone should be mindful and everyone should practice self-care and no one knows really what either one of those things are because they're very individualistic in nature. So there's, there's, it's hard to come up with a universal definition of such broad constructs. I spend a lot of time working, you know, with our workforce in this state and I hear a lot of self-care behavior around, I call it self, almost like self-neglect. So everybody else, you know, in my life will get the service that they need. I'll do a good job at work. I'll serve my family as best I can. I'll serve, you know, children if we have them. I'll take care of our animals. And then at the end of the day, it's something like, you know, I'll take a shower, self-care. If your hygiene ritual is in your self-care plan right now, you are doing it wrong. All right. That's just called having a life. You should get to do these things. You should get to have you know, go home and watch television and have a life, go to the movies, do all the things that are part of living, that doesn't necessarily mean you're practicing self-care. So 
When I tried to create a social work dictionary, for lack of better terms, definition of what self-care actually looks like, it's the utilization of skills and strategies, right? Not just to take care of our work lives, but also how we do our personal care, how we provide care for our family, how we take care of our own mental health um, and our physical health and our spiritual health, whatever that looks like, while also attending to the complex needs of others. And part of this is I put self-care on the front end of this definition to reinforce that it's okay to do things to keep yourself whole and happy and healthy so that you can be the best quality social worker. So you can deliver the best quality services that you have to offer. This is not always easy to do. Um, I get that, that we all have real lives and we all have kids. At, most of us have kids at home. We have partners, we have soccer games, we have all the things, right? But that can be woven into the tapestry of your self-care if you serve with intention. And what I find is that it's sort of the missing piece here. And I could spend, do another whole webinar just on this, but what I've found in my work over 20 years of data, so this is not tried, these are thousands and thousands of points of data, is that social workers tend not to realize when they're in this space of taking care of others that there's only so much psychological energy within one human being to expend. It's not an infinite you know, level of empathetic energy that you have. It's like a fuel tank. So it gets drained. And if you're using you know, empathy, which I feel like is actually the fuel for our work, if you're using that day in and day out and you're using it all day long, and then I don't, I don't know about you guys, I'm on screen share, but I bet if I could see your faces, my eight-year-old daughter, um, you know, I don't want to swear too much, but she didn't really give a shit if I've had a bad day. She wants, you know, me to be attentive to her. She wants me to show up for her. She wants me to do all these things. And, you know, if you're operating on a lower reservoir of empathy, because you've used that psychological energy all day long, many social workers don't understand that 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 tapping, you know, when you feel like your fuel gauge is empty, the refueling is self-care, right? So you have to refuel, rebuild that and understand that there are times when your work may make you feel drained. The comparison there, and I think the take-home point is that doesn't mean you have a traumatized psychological or central nervous system that means you have a normal one. It actually means you have an above average ability to generate psychological empathy to do the work when compared to others. So my best friend, Bart the Banker, I always call him that, so I refer to him. His work every day is about watching. He works in a cubicle, has for years. He watches ticker tape, he invests money. He never sees a person. What little you know psychological empathy he has he always has on reserve for himself and his family. And I say that almost through bitterness and professional jealousy, because he doesn't understand what we have to do to do the work that we do. And it's really hard to explain that to someone if your partner's not in our profession, who doesn't have to go in and show up fully loaded and empathetic every day to get the work done. And I think that's an underestimated part of social work. So I say that to say the brain is not traumatized. For me, when I say a brain's traumatized, that's a very clinical um, diagnostic explanation versus something that actually can be, you know, you can practice self-care and refuel in such a way that you're not having to receive trauma treatment. And so also I'm very careful around utilizing these constructs um, with social workers, because I want them to understand that if they feel drained by the work, that that's a normative reaction, considering the time that you're spending, you know, with people who are in a place of suffering. And that makes this seem, you know, less like the big, ugly, you know, monster that's burnout and trauma that's around the corner that's going to get you at some point in the profession, and more like a reasonable social problem that we can address. So how I look at, you know, self-care I look at the whole person and I charge, you know, when I do workshops, 
you don't have to go and, you know, sort of take on this entire framework. But I do charge everyone to sort of look at within their own life course or their own life space, what keeps them most whole. And to do a little bit of self-analysis here, sort of turn the skills, those good clinical social work skills we all claim to have inward. We don't tend to do a good job on ourselves as a profession in general, turn inward and really look at what strategies I have to take care of myself interpersonally. Am I showing up for my family? That, that shows up in my research quite a bit. Social workers experience sometimes professional guilt you know, about not showing up in other places to take care of their family when they feel like they're focused on the work. And some of our qualitative data from our lab, there we have story after story of social workers who said, you know, I'm there, but I'm not there. So sometimes showing up with self-care as an intention might be to show up at the soccer game or the gymnastics meet, that's what we do, watch gymnastics, without being engaged in work. What does that look like? It looks like Jason putting up his phone in his pocket and setting a boundary and saying, I'm not going to look at this. I'm going to watch my daughter because she's going to notice if I'm on my phone, right? So part of that is just showing up for her when you unpack what does self-care actually look like. Recreational activities, our data suggests that, so health and well-being measures like healthy eating, uh, dietary things, exercise during times of stress, they go out the window first, over and again, no matter what population we sampled. So over and again, we've heard people say, well, you know, I, I'll be back and forth with my exercise routine when I get stressed, you know, maybe I move to eating more unhealthy, less likely to exercise. Some people say they exercise is stress reduction for them, but I can tell you in our sample, um, and maybe it's because we only sample human service workers, but that tends to be the thing that goes out the window first. So we hear a lot, you know, in our, in our clinic of social workers who feel like they need to put some measures in. Uh, peer support, which means taking care of your friends, having a strong support network that exists outside of the organization um, shows up as a form of self-care. The one that's most gray is one at the bottom. So there's, you know, positive life experiences. Well, you know, what does that look like? Joy. You know, what in your life that's really, I call the, is there an area in your life that is life giving for you that you're backing away from? So self-care can be just moving toward the areas of your life that are giving for you during times of stress, rather than moving toward things that don't serve you or maladaptive coping, which is for some people eating, it could be sleeping too much. It could be, you know, using drugs or using alcohol or turning to something that's not going to serve you as coping because that takes you sort of out of that moment of stress. So literally you wanna think, you know, what in my life have I moved away from that served me that I could take a small step today to put back? Because self-care shouldn't be an overwhelming. I hear that a lot from participants too. They feel like they need to do all of these things to get their lives in check. And that could not be further from the truth. You pick one and you work on one thing, right? You give yourself some space and some grace to make a small change that could serve you and see how that change grows. For spiritual work, you know, if you are a religious person, um, that falls within this. If you moved away from your religious practice, um, that could be your yoga practice, any spiritual practice that you have, spending time outside with nature, going to do meditation, anything that you do that serves your spiritual life. Where, does, where is that, that area or that space? And are you pulling away from that? And then, which is so interesting in our work, and we've looked at this every way that we can, the agency actually tends to show up last. And so that's a little counterintuitive to the data, which says, you know, what can the organization do for me? Well, there may be limits in bureaucratic organizations in terms of what they can do for you. And that may fall into a category of, well, I can't control the policy. I can't control the number of clients that come in. But I 
may be able to control, you know, making sure I show up at the soccer game. I may, you know, I can control my diet. I can control my spiritual practice. I can control whether or not I go to my own therapy appointments if I need them. I have control over those decisions. And so when I see, you know, sort of talk about self-care, that's how I like to look at this. It should be an overwhelming experience. It should be very methodically and purposely looking at what activities within your life space will help you cope with the stress that is inherent to being a practitioner of social work. And now I'd like to, st I'm gonna stop my share and go back to Kara and Kara, help me understand from the audience, you know, from our, our participants, what it is, if someone would be willing to share maybe a common problem in their agency or a personal experience that they've had. And let's see if we can give an example of how to utilize the framework. And I can't see the audience. I can see Kara. Um, so I can't see you guys. So you'll have to chat in mm -hmm. and let us try to unpack that together. But also I want to see you guys offer up. So we're all practitioners here. We're all trained to be problem solvers. So if we have an experience there, the audience can often share with each other, you know, here's what I did when I was in your situation and we can all learn in a collective space. So I don't know what's showing up. Do we well, have any? Somebody, I asked if anybody would want to uh, share a current challenge. Um, if you want to just write in a current challenge in the chat, um, we'd love to hear from you and we could try to uh, utilize the framework. So um, Christy is brave and chatting in balance home needs work needs relationship needs um all seem overwhelming we have quite a few that just chatted in so that's that's one i don't know if we want to start there we just have somebody who said i just lost a client to an overdose and struggling with that well i'm so sorry oh yeah the challenge is staff shortage lack of staffing so what do you want to all right, so it seems like staffing is coming up over, <laughs> it's kind of holding its own. So what, so what you would do in this situation, so this is an organizational issue. And you have to think in terms of reality, Karen and I were talking about this, what within your organization can you control? Can you control whether someone else quits or leaves? No. But, you, but with, with that also comes all the clients or the caseload they were carrying. So that's gonna automatically get farmed out to everyone in the organization. How does your organization look at that work? Um, and how can you help manage if you're getting more clients looking at your caseload and seeing where you might could build time in, how you might have to actually change your current practice to meet your current situation. Be really honest with yourself about how much you can do. You might have to set boundaries with clients. And, you know, I don't like to say this out loud, but you have to kind of look at the minimal standards and do as much as you can to meet that. And then if there's some overflow, you can reallocate that time. You also want to look at, you know, if you're feeling like this work is consuming you, and you can't dedicate any other time to those other areas of your life, what are you cutting out? So what are you giving up? And sometimes that's really practical. So if you're missing things that are for your own health and wellness to meet the health and wellness needs of others, then something in that framework is gonna suffer, right? So if I'm showing up 300% to meet the health and wellness needs of my clients, but I'm not taking my own daughter to the doctor, that's not good. Or this is what happens in my data. And I was telling Kara, there's no social worker because of how we're trained is going to show up and say, I'm not doing for my own kids. All of their appointments are met, but I'm canceling all of mine. Right. And that's not, that's not serving you. So that's what I would call a maladaptive response to the stress. It's telling yourself, you know, I can miss something or I'll take something away from myself as long as everyone else is taken care of. And some of that I feel like goes back to our social work value conflict for us because service is our first value. So we're taught so 
much around our work is around serving others. And that's important and it is primary, but we often forget to say in that conversation that you are a part of that. So serving yourself and keeping yourself healthy allows you to serve others in your best capacity. So sometimes self-care might just be setting a boundary around that and accepting that maybe you can only do so much and just getting, even though in your heart, you want to do as so much more, but the organization is only giving you enough time and space to do, you know, this much and just kind of accepting whatever that much looks like. But that's a heavy conversation because we want in our hearts to do better, right? And we want to do as much as we can. And we're so dedicated to doing the work. So where the hard part of this is, there's a boundary with yourself that exists within that. So, you know, if our ego wants to serve and it wants, you know, to do that, can I tell myself, you know, this is all I can do right now and that's going to have to be enough. And, and that can be difficult for social work. And it's certainly not a conversation. You walk in, you know, it's, you can't walk into your supervisor's office and go, I've done all I can do and that's going to have to be enough. And so organizationally, I would coach the person, you know, don't, don't charge your supervisor's office and announce that and say, you're going to quit if. Think about what that conversation looks like. Really describe to your supervisor what you're doing. Here's the stress it's putting on myself and my family. Can you help me? with that before you make the decision to leave. Because often as a, as a former supervisor, what I would find is my social workers would just take so much and then they would charge the office and go, this is it. And I would say, well, why, where was this like two months ago? Why are we, you know, what are you waiting on? And so maybe just kind of think about if you're having that conversation with your supervisor, you're addressing that issue, your supervisor's hands are tied with bureaucracy in the same way that yours are. But does your supervisor truly understand your situation or are they just reading your anger and frustration and responding to that? So in other words, use social work skill. We're all taught communication skills as part of our work. We're taught to engage clients with respect or you know, use those good social work practice skills that are so deeply ingrained in your way of doing to serve you. But we're bad at that. So just know, tap on the shoulder, myself included, bad client that, you know, when I get upset, you know, so it's, you know, it's all of us sort of within that. It's like, you know, it's not always easy to practice what you preach, but you can move toward that and that can be help. What's the chat looking like here? I see your face moving. It's like, you're reading. what's going on? Yeah. I mean, so much. I mean, I just, in some ways want to take a moment and just shine some light to everybody that's here um, and just recognize kind of the the depth of challenge that people are sitting in and sitting with because uh, it's so real, you know, from having people being triggered by clients with the, the realness of what clients are going through and, and it triggering their own kind of mental health or other challenges that they have in their families. Um, someone stated a previous employer for 10 years, she attempted to talk to them several times about these issues as you're suggesting. And the answer was always pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Um, and then, you know, some people are saying we need boundaries with ourselves. Uh, something I always tell my clients is they have to take care of themselves before they can take care of others. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, then eventually you'll get to a place where you can't take of any, care of anyone else as you, you know, so are we taking that same advice was part of the conversation a minute ago, right? The I data can't... would suggest no, that yeah. you're much more likely to tell a client to do something and then undercut. So I would never, not to interrupt you, Kara, but whoever made that, that's just a good point. If you're telling your clients this, you would never tell your client. So I, I'm a mental health professional, Kara. I've been working with people as a therapist for 20 years. I would not tell my client, hey, Kara, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and maybe you won't be right. the next week. Or, you know, hey, go home and take a shower and everything will be okay, you know. So that's not self-care. So you wouldn't prescribe that, right? We wouldn't do that to our clients. We wouldn't say, you know, maybe if you go home and just relax tonight, you know, you won't be domestically abusive next, you know, next week. So it makes good sense, just sort of taking ourselves out into the good common sense sort of space. If I wouldn't prescribe this to a client, mm -hmm. why am I less worthy 
you know, if I need to do my own mental health work, or if I need to do my own doctor visit, or if I need to do, why am I less worthy than that? You know, what, what a value am I giving to myself in this matrix and what value, you know? And so it's interesting when I ask social workers that question and they go, yeah, I mean, I get it. Um, no one, I've been taking my mom to her doctor appointment who's elderly, you know, three times a week for three years. I haven't been to the doctor for three years. Something's not right with that, right? There's, but you're making, you know, you're giving yourself, taking away from yourself to give to others. And maybe there needs to be a regulation of that. So it's okay within a self-care space to ask for a little back or to set a boundary with your family and say, you know, dad needs to like, rest today (laughs) you know i've been going you know i'm gonna go to the game or i'm but you know maybe just sort of set those boundaries and as social workers too i don't know how our audience feels in other areas of our lives i feel like we're go-to because of our profession so we're really good pto people we're really good school fundraisers we're really good you know at whatever we get asked to do and sometimes we're not good at saying yeah i don't have maybe not this time but call on me for the next one and I'll, I'll, I'll see. It can be hard sometimes not to want to serve um, in that capacity and not to want to show up in those capacities. So that's boundary regulation. And there's also sort of going back to my previous conversation, there's empathy self-regulation, mm. which is such a powerful, it's a very, what I would call a very advanced practice skill. And empathy self-regulation is you know, you only have so much to give, but you may also be the go-to when someone passes on in the family and then you have to do family support. Or you may be that person in a friend group who can offer up that supportive friendship whenever something turns sideways. And again, that pulls from your reservoir. And so sometimes it's, you know, knowing that that inside of us is, it's a construct. It's like love. It's like compassion. It's like sympathy. It's a psychological resource that has a start and a stop. Mm. And if you're working all day long and then best friend calls and guess what, I'm getting a divorce, you're still at work. I know you don't think you are, but your head is using that same skill because that's what you do. And then you've got the kids and their needs. And then it's like, what's left for dad at the end of the day? And that's when I'll hear like, oh, well, I took a shower. Well, self-care, you have to do that, but that's not gonna profoundly change your personal or professional life. It just, you just took a shower. Yeah. Empathy, self-regulation. Everybody hear that? I love that. Yeah. And I can do a whole webinar just around that because it's the neurobiology of how we create that is fascinating. And that actually showed up as a proxy to everything else I was studying. Mm -hmm. It was the variable that kind of snuck in. It's what we call a confounding variable because we were trying to figure out, you know, where do we turn the corner between being stressed and burned out? And where do I turn the corner between having a really deeply disturbing session and having a traumatizing session? Like, where does the mind actually take that step, right? And what we learned is that when we create empathy, at some point, your brain will put a stop gap in there. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, it's not like when your kid says, mommy, how much do you love me? And you go, well, I mean, I don't know this much. Empathy doesn't really work, you know, that way. It actually has to regulate. And if you're pulling from that and then families get home, you find yourself, maybe you're snappy or not. It doesn't mean you're being bad mom or dad or partner. It just means that that empathy level has gotten so low Mm -hmm. that you're, you're sort of running on an empty tank. Mm -hmm. The car's not going to drive if there's no fuel in there. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to show up as mom and show up as parent and show up as good social worker and show up at whatever you're doing 100% if your empathy is low. And that goes back to Bart the banker. He don't have to do all that. So when he shows up the PTO, his empathy is at 100% because he hasn't been listening to the trauma of other people all day long. So it's a very different life experience. And I think that empathy self-regulation has been very underestimated variable and it may be what we have been calling trauma and compassion fatigue for so long and trauma has a pejorative undertone to it Mm -hmm. so saying that i'm you know a tired emotionally tired social worker sounds very in need to refuel sounds very different than saying i'm a traumatized social worker and it could be the same thing 
Um, so I, I'm really careful again around those concepts because I don't, because I, when I hear trauma, my little diagnostic brain codes it that way. Mm -hmm. But when I hear, you know, maybe compassion fatigue, which is a little more friendly, I say, well, yeah, and then that's a different feeling. Mm -hmm. And when we get into the secondary trauma conversation, how I tease that out is there's a big, and you guys are New Yorkers, this is going to be a big hit home for you. There's a big difference maybe in being in the Twin Towers when they fell or watching it on C-SPAN. So I'm in Alabama watching it. I had a reaction to that trauma, right? If you're in New York, you had a direct experience. That's very different. And so, when, you know, I think more being in New York, direct experience when I hear trauma, not watching it on television or having a secondary experience. So that's how in my head I've teased that out, right? When I see, you know, it breaks my heart every time there's a school shooting. Like I literally want to just be like, what the hell's going on? but it's different than having a child in that school. And I'm terrified, but it's still different, right? So we have to learn to tell our brains to kind of tease that out. And our clients at work are, what we, are kind of like what we see on TV. Our personal lives are the direct experiences and they all require empathy. And, and just knowing that years of training, it took me years to figure out that when I get you know, at the end of a really long day, if I'm feeling like that empathy is drained, that my personality is a little different because it needs to refuel instead of saying, you know, sort of looking at it as like I'm not enough in some way, right? So instead of looking at the not enoughness, I forget, wow, you've been on since seven o'clock this morning and you've, you've forgotten all the stories you heard at nine because the two, you know, that's a lot of psychological trauma to process, for one brain that's 45 years old, that's still, it does a lot of work. And that, that I think has kind of been a little bit of an illuminating understanding for us in social work that, you know, you can show up and if you're feeling tired, it's okay. It's, it's more than okay. Cause nobody else is doing the shit that you're doing. Right. And it's okay to feel that it doesn't make you less than as a social worker. It makes you more than because you get up the next morning after you rest and go back. And I think that's important for us to hear as a profession too, that we're validated and that we earn our paychecks and we work so hard for them. And it's okay to need space to refuel and to watch your own show, <laughs> you know, do something to give yourself something back. Mm -hmm. I do that at professional conferences, nothing. I know it's work, but I can camouflage it because I can go and get a hotel room <laughs> and I can rest and I can be a spectator in the audience and nobody knows me and I can just sit and listen. And that for me is very refueling. Spending time with my family is a refuel. Um, going on a vacation and making it stick is a refuel, setting those boundaries. So like we have no device policies in our house. That's just household rule for us. You know, if we're having dinner, we're going to sit here and look at each other or we're going to come up with a conversation. Like we force that because it's so easy to default to, to this. And then it's like, why aren't we talking? And it's not that anybody intends for that to happen. It just does. So you have to kind of look at it like that too, like the dieting issue, you know, no one intends to go down that pathway. We just do. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my guilt. I'll tell you if I've had a long, hard day, at six o'clock workout, I have no guilt or shame about hitting the snooze button saying, nah, I'll get to that tomorrow or later. But that can easily become a pattern, right? If I let that go on for a couple of weeks, the new pattern is I'm not going to work out. And I guess I don't care. And that's the problem. So I have to set the intention again, you know, and, you know, kind of make that happen. But it's not, you know, like that's what I'm seeking out. Sometimes life just does that. So, yeah. Um the boundaries, right? Figuring out what refuels you, identifying important boundaries for you and where you may need to put them and maybe where you need to take them away or what have you. There are a lot of people chatting in about supervisors and uh, the helpfulness of some someone chatted in that they have a really great supervisor and how much that protects them and helps them. And then several other people are chatting in that supervisors are burnt out and tired and it seeps into their own uh, selves and, and the work that they do. And so just a any thoughts there around supervision would be really helpful. Makes all the difference in the world, mm -hmm. especially for young social workers to have a supervisor that they feel supported by 
versus a supervisor that they feel threatened by. And that's a big deal because the supervisor's job is to take care of the frontline worker, in my opinion, whatever that looks like. Their job is to, their practice is to listen to the frontline workers who are learning what they already know and to coach and advise and keep social workers feeling comfortable in their jobs and not feeling like, you know, we don't want to get into, you know, social work is a highly litigious field in a lot of ways, and we have to watch out for policies. And there's so much around that, but also we have to take care of each other and you can't go to work in fear of that. That compromises the work in many ways. And so I, I hate to go to a conference and, you know, every venue is how not to get, you know, the liability policy and litigation effects of this, because um, it makes social workers feel compromised. And, you know, the supervisor's job is to help soften that and to be supportive. And supervisors, believe me, they get as stressed as everybody else. You just don't always see it. But part of that, for me, with a good supervisor is they've learned to cope with that stress. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. it's even harder of a, of a situation to be in as a supervisor, right? Because you're kind of stuck in the middle mm -hmm. of other leadership and overseeing a lot of work. So, yeah. And maybe you're one notch above. Maybe you're a frontline worker a year ago, you know, so it's not like most supervisors are way up in the tower. I mean, they're just mm -hmm. maybe one one rung on the ladder, you know, above, you know, being a direct line worker. And we have a lot of young supervisors right now in our state, and we're trying to do our best to keep them because in our vision for child welfare in particular, so these young supervisors are going to be running social service in 10 years. And we've got, you know, we've got to keep them healthy and happy in their career so that we have, we can keep our system flowing. Because mm -hmm. if everybody leaves, I mean, you I'm sorry, I'm a college professor. We can't have 22 year old inexperienced social workers supervising. That's that's not going to work, right? They have to learn before they can do that. I see a lot in my chat, and I don't know if you want to pivot here or we, we're running. We're at 12:30, and I'm very mindful of of what I want to do in the webinar. Mm -hmm. um, but the empathy seemed to have struck a chord about the psychological empathy and sort of looking at that. So that that may be something that that we can look at later, because that's a really interesting, you know, if we look at the neurobiology of empathy self-regulation, that's that's a huge, that was a game changer in terms of what we're doing here and in terms of me looking at practice um, from a central nervous system perspective. Um, we might be able to do that, but I really would like. Care, I'm kind of looking at you for validation and like to kind of move into more of the how can I serve do a plan and what is this? Yeah, really I think that's important. Yes. Um, somebody's talking about how their uh, supervisor allows healing circles, and that is just fantastic. I think any opportunity uh, for you all to get together and uh, have supportive circles with each other can be really healing. But yes, I think let's move in. What do you all think? Let's move into some practice and application. Are we getting thumbs up? Thumbs up. All right. So yeah. where do we start? What is a work, okay. what the be all end all, what does a work life balance look like? If, if, if we only knew what we know is that it's, it's much like social work. So we'll go here. So we'll stay here for just a second, but much like in social work, every plan is individual, no human being, no family is the same. So that's why we practice. So I, I wish, you know, we had formulas like a mathematician. If you do it this way, every time you circle the answer, it's going to be right. So social work I always say is the complete and polar opposite of what that framework for correctness looks like. We have models, we have methods, we have theories, we apply them, we're eclectic. Sometimes it might work, sometimes it might not. You know, one person's response is, is different than the next person. So I always say, you know, we have to be so much more educated to be social worker than a mathematician because we're not, we, we're never gonna have a formula. We don't have that. We you know we have an approach. And that's why we use that language in social work school. You know, we say this is one approach to this a problem, but there are multiple approaches and, you know, ways we use a, We actually use language like a problem solving approach to demonstrate that there are multiple ways of doing in any one space. So we move away from a very formulated or legalistic approach. But what we do have 
is we have a core set of skills that works so inherently well with the practice of self-care if you're able to turn self-care into an essential practice, which it should be. And we have done a really poor job in terms of social work standards of bringing that point home. Counseling standards have that integrated in. Kara, you mentioned, you know, I'm on the faculty of our counseling program doing self work. <laughs> That's in the standards for them. It's not in our standards for social work education or practice. It has been only this year that we have seen the council and social work education add a language of self care to our teaching standards. NASW has actually pivoted and added self care language into our ethics code. So we are leveling up as a profession in terms of our expectation. And I always say that for social workers who really wanna practice self-care, there's really no further training needed. What's needed is the commitment to do the work. You guys are trained to case manage, to write treatment plans, to use task center, to do, create a task, to, to problem solve within any life space. You understand your behavior, the behavior of others, you have all of this in your clinical toolbox right now. The problem is sort of getting it to work and using that to fuel your own self-care practice. So if we could, I'm going to stop this share and go to our handouts. And if I'm not mistaken, you guys have access to this material. Am I right? Yes, I'm going to resend right now as well. It's in the chat, everyone. So you can just click on it in the chat and Kiara sent it as well. Um, thank you, Kiara. So you can just click on it and it'll open up into your window. So you should have a copy of the framework. And underneath, this is an exercise. Can you see this, Kara? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So this is an exercise for work-life balance. I call it kind of finding your box. So what can I do in real talk, in real time? What can I do today? First thing is you don't want to do all of these things because you will fail. So don't go into self-care practice with a mindset if you need to do a complete radical overhaul of your entire life, because we know that those things fail. We do that on New Year's Eve. How many of you guys like me, you've had plenty of time now to drop, you know, any resolution because, you know, a resolution is I'm only, you know, I'm going to lose 40 pounds by June. You know, I resolve to do that. And we know that that rarely ever happens. But what you can resolve to do with reality, you can intend to maybe change a behavior. We know that, that that's a workable thing. So part of it is just setting an intention. So maybe looking at an area of your life space where you really want to make a positive change to serve yourself and not shy away from a language of, you know, I'm doing this just for me and feeling some sort of professional or personal guilt or shame around, you know, doing something that just serves you. Everybody else, by the way, in the world does that and they don't call, they don't have shame over it. You know, my wife and her profession, if she's going to, you know, do something or having a spa day, she doesn't have shame around it. She's always looking for what's not being done. So maybe let some of that go. And if you wanna set a biological or physiological goal, really look at maybe something you've backed away from that at some point in your life was serving to you. So it could be your exercise ritual. If you're not exercising now, you know, think about your clients. You wouldn't set a pie in the sky goal for someone who has not have an exercise routine to say, well, you're going to be a marathon runner. You're not going to do that. So maybe you just need to get up from your desk and walk around as a start for 50 minutes and let that be a win. And then maybe next week you'll level up to 20 minutes or maybe the next day, but don't set a goal that's unattainable. That's the New Year's Eve perspective. So we're really talking about resolving versus, you know, ritualism in a positive way, which means create a new pattern, right? So create a new pattern and behavior. Uh, maybe you want to put an interpersonal goal in there. What is something you'd really like personally to work on? And Kara and I were talking about the resistance sometimes in our profession to doing our own self-work, which I call that professional hypocrisy. You should not be resistant to consuming a service that you claim to provide. 
So if you need therapeutic work or if you need to do something, you know, interpersonally, you want to embrace that in the same way you would prescribe to a client or think about it, you know, like you're talking to your best friend. If your best friend's saying they're stressed to you, they need to work on something or they're depressed or going through divorce, whatever their circumstance is, would you ever say, right, using that metaphor of suck it up and move on? Or would you say, no, you should probably do some work around that to keep yourself whole. So if you have to go to that space to figure this out, that's perfectly fine. Think about, you know, I'm talking to my best friend here. Here's what I would recommend and sort of acknowledging that you're equally as worthy of that. Um, if you need to make an organizational change, there may be limits there, but there's certainly something that you can do within the organization, within your own, own organizational practice. Um, whether that's, you know, your time management skills or whether that's setting boundaries with your clients or, or yourself in some way to make your work-life balance seem more reasonable. If you have a familial goal, that's, those are really important. So what is it? How are you showing up for your family and what boundaries can you regulate within that? Spiritual, recreational. I mean, this is not the be all end all framework. It's meant to teach you. It's a model method in theory, right? So you're picking the parts of it that apply to you and your life circumstances and you're creating. And this does help because there's a lot of power in the intention. So don't just tell yourself you're going to do better because if, you know, don't do it work, we all wouldn't be here because we just tell our clients, you know, don't be anxious, I guess, and go home or don't domestically abuse or we know that 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 does not work. It doesn't work with your clients and it doesn't work with you. But what you might be able to do is just write down that intention. This week, I will get up from my desk once a day and I will walk around this building for 15 minutes without my phone and I'll give myself or I will take a lunch break that doesn't involve returning emails or addressing the needs of the organization in some way. I will take that break. I will show up on time for my gymnastics meet at 530. And then underneath that intention, I want you to write down how that will serve you. So by taking this 15 minute break, this serves me in such a way that I can decompress from two and a half or three hours of work. I can eat a healthy lunch without returning email and being involved in work and give myself time to digest the food and make sure I take, you know, don't eat your lunch in three minutes. I can show up so my daughter knows I'm there and I can watch what she's doing because that serves her and that makes me feel like a better parent. So lean into those self-care goals, give them some teeth. And then that's, that's what we're taught to do with our clients, right? Client's not gonna respond to a goal that doesn't have meaning and value behind it. And so we're just doing that, that what I call the problem solving approach, the task centered, you're giving yourself a task, hold yourself to task with accountability in the absence of shame or self-judgment. So underneath here, this is sort of what I would call maybe an advance, but this, if you really wanna go social work, you know, full odd, you know, you can set the goal and objective. You can give yourself a timeline. It looks a lot like a treatment plan, but there's something valuable about going in and filling this out for yourself. There's something valuable about identifying the areas of your life that serve you that you can lean into during times of stress. And if you really want to level up, you can look at what are your maladaptive stress habits. So when I'm stressed, I'll choose not to maybe overeat as coping. I will choose to take that 15 minute walk and I will know that that's better for me and that will serve me, All right? It'll make me feel better all day long. So you have to look at this like it has value. You can't just say, I'm gonna be a better self-care professional or I'm gonna provide myself a better self-care without knowing what it looks like. That's like telling your depressed client, don't be depressed and do better without explaining to them what depression is, what the symptoms are and how to regulate the feelings and then giving them a plan. So you're just holding yourself to that same level of accountability. So maybe your first step is 
to fill this out, maybe come up with one, one small, very small, but very helpful change that you can make to your own behavior that will serve you and serve your family or whoever your loved ones are around you. Think, think very small. And then also turn on your, your CBT mind and think, all right, it's going to take my brain about two weeks to realize, or 10 days actually, neurobiologically to realize that this is a real change. You're going to get over the hump where your brain's mad at you for giving up sugar or caffeine or whatever your small change is. And then you'll be in a new pattern within 10 days and that's the payoff. And that can really be the measure. And I know it sounds, you know, to an untrained social worker, that sounds complicated, but to, you know, you guys are boots on the ground. You do this every single day. So this should, this should be really like another language. It should be second nature for you to be able to see things from this lens. And one thing I wanted to say as I kind of stop in the share, and I'll come back to room and see what's going on in chat. One of the most important things that we can do, Kara and everyone else, is when you go into self-care and you write this plan, if you mess up, so let's just say you were really busy today, you didn't do your 15-minute walk. That doesn't mean you throw the self-care plan out the window and call it, you know, you wouldn't tell your client, don't do that. Don't go into a space of self-judgment because you cannot practice self-care and self-judgment in the same space because they cancel each other out. Does that make sense? So if you're judging yourself for missing or not being enough or not showing up in some way, you can't practice self-care because it just they just cancel each other out. So part of the boundary is I'm not going to self-judge in this space. I'm just going to do my walk tomorrow. That's it. That is my intention. My intention is to not self-judge and pick up where, just like you would tell a client, right? You wouldn't tell a client, throw, throw your treatment plan out the window if you mess up one time. I know we have some addictions people here that are saying, we, we would never get anything done because, you know, addicts, they come back and that's just part of the work and recovery is difficult. And, you know, only one in four, you know, stay sober the first time. So you see the other three again, you would never say, well, you know, you didn't make it, sorry. So you want to extend that own grace or that own room to yourself in your own psychological space to, you know, mess up every once in a while to miss the walk or, you know, go the fast food route once a week or something and then move back into your plan. And if you hold accountability and intention, then the plan should work for you. If it's just a New Year's Eve, you know, resolution, it's gone by March. I mean, it's the same stuff we already know. This is not new news, but it's really hard sometimes for me to see it from my internally. I can talk all day long externally and be a really good coach, but I have to remind myself daily, you know, to show up in these places and know that the outcome is that I'm going to feel more resilient. And that's what self-care looks like for me. It's not taking a shower. It's not watching my favorite show on TV. That's stuff I do anyway. Um, and you kind of water down the concept if you allow yourself to believe that doing these simple life tasks are going to change your personal quality of life or your professional quality of life in any, any measure. What's the chat looking like? Chat's looking good. Some people couldn't open up the resources, so we're mailing them to them. Um, and then there's a great conversation around, you know, if you put things down and you don't get to them, can you identify the barriers? So go a little deeper with yourself around what are the barriers here um, and what can you do to remove them? So I thought that was, <coughs> I thought that sounded like a helpful um, discussion and a few people chimed in about it. So um, I'm wondering, should, do you recommend that people start with one area? Yes. Don't try to do it all or you will fail. So you have to, you really have to self-assess and go, what can I handle? You can't go into all 10 areas and say, guess what, family? You know, dad's changing our entire life around this self-care plan. It will actually go out the window really quickly. Think of something very small to start. So um, health and wellness, which is the ones that my research say go out first, is usually where I recommend to start with something small, like a 50-minute walk or maybe give something up. So, you know, if you found yourself as a stress point, maybe I'm projecting here, but 
food or sugar, you know, when I'm stressed is a really good elixir, you know, so you can give me a donut and I'm going to be happy for it because I'm going to get that dopamine hit and I'm going to be happy for a little bit. So maybe the change is, all right, so when I'm feeling stressed, I'll move to something a little different and just be mindful that that's, that's a coping mechanism for me. So that's small. It doesn't cost anything. I haven't bought a Peloton. I haven't invested a lot of money. What I'm doing is just sort of acknowledging my behavior and finding that pause in the synapse, that purposeful pause is what I call it. And there's a purposeful pause, you know, when our synapse fires for, you know, reacting to a stimulus and maybe just inserting something different. Mm -hmm. And there's a really great quote around that that I love from Victor Frankl about finding the purposeful pause. And that just means just pausing before you react, just inserting a small space so that mm -hmm. your fuse, you know, your fuse is like this. The goal is not to have the longest fuse in the world. The goal is just to have a fuse that's long enough that you're not reacting, that you're, you're mindfully reacting. And on that note, in terms of our practice, I did have, as we get to the one o'clock hour, a little mindful activity that I love that you can do at your desk that I wanted to take maybe a couple of minutes to do. I can do that in five minutes and that'll leave a couple of minutes for us to check out. How do you feel about that? I think that's great. I think if everybody do want to just chat in, chat in the area that you're going to be focusing on. Um, we have somebody who's a physical goal. Uh, so they're going to they're going to focus on that area, taking a 50 minute walk at lunch outside, fresh air to be able to decompress and start their afternoon mm -hmm. with a fresh perspective starting tomorrow. Love it. Um, Somebody said care days, kayaking, camping, et cetera. So just pick one, you know, you know, what is it then? And then the first thing said, the physical goal, start small. Yeah. Doing reading and walking, you know, that seems really silly, but, you know, re don't read social work magazine you know if you're going to use if reading is an escapism for you I love to read but I'll find myself drawn to books that teach a new therapy that that doesn't count all right so let's you have to go because I mean it's fascinating to me mm -hmm. yeah reading werewolf books that counts so put that on the list I love <laughs> it yeah who wants to have a pool if they're not swimming in it you know mm -hmm. exercise that's the intellectual thing I was talking about we all know that exercise makes us feel better it's just that point is choosing to do it when you're tired that sucks and so you might have to push that button just a little bit no oh, I love this someone said I'm going to get a rose outside each week and put on my desk to make me smile that's so sweet and if hey, someone hey, is hey. going to come in whoever said that and go what's up with the rose and you're going to say you know what I just bought this for myself and I like it and it makes me feel better and you should try it. <laughs> yeah, the self-care guy said, but the idea is that Rose reminds you that's your physical reminder that you're valuable and that you need to pursue your plan of care. That Rose will be your, your thing. So when you look at that, it's gonna embody how beautiful it is to feel whole in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's, that's the intention. So that's wrapping your brain around the value of the activity versus, you know, it sounds so mundane to just say, yeah, I got a rose, <laughs> you know, there's, there's some, there's more to it than that. So dig a little deeper, you know, think about your clients in therapy. When you ask them, what does that represent for you? What is that rose of what value is that holding up for you? What's the purpose of that sitting on your desk? I mean, we ask this crap all the time, <laughs> you know, it's instinctual for me to lean into the camera to somebody I don't even know and ask those questions. But sometimes with Jason, I forget and just kind of move on to the next thing. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so even, like, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I said, even with moments of success, you know, I find myself, if I have a goal and meet it, I won't put the pause in to even acknowledge it. I move on to the next thing immediately, right? It's like, okay, well, now I got to have something else to pursue instead of slowing down, slow your roll, man. Mm -hmm. Sit here and enjoy this moment. And I think that for me seems really practical than some of the other self-care that we hear on TV or, you know, it's just like, you know, self-care can know it has to have meaning, value, and purpose to be a caring activity and accountability, and intention and lack of judgment. Mm 
Mm. And those are kind of the ingredients. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing self-care so you can get out of self-shame, you know, you got to watch how those two things cross over. So lack of judgment, intention, and what? Accountability. And accountability, right. Yeah, yeah, just hold yourself to some level that's not a shaming level. That's why doing things in groups is so helpful as well, right? There is some yeah. natural accountability in there. Um, I So, I, you know, it's interesting that those things that bring us joy are things that we drop when we're stressed. You know, somebody's saying, um, my guitar, I miss my guitar. I haven't played my guitar and, or I haven't danced or I haven't done art. Those things that, that fill us in a variety of ways are sometimes those are the things that we let go of first. So we just maybe picking those back up can kind of have a domino effect as well in terms of, of self-care. So I just love all this. Do we want to do the activity real quick? Yeah. And I love the physicality of that. Whoever said guitar, because when you pick that up, what does this really mean to me? It's more than just the object. It's, it's the art, it's the music. It's that I go to a place when I'm with this guitar, with this music, when I'm dancing, whatever, what I'm doing, that's, that's self-soothing. And mm -hmm. you haven't gone and bought a class. You haven't done a webinar. Like this is one, but I'm saying you don't have to invest. You have the tools exactly. right there in your house. Yeah. Just go pick it up. You know, Serenity is asking, I know Serenity, I, I wonder the same. Why is it that we let go of our joys first? I guess because maybe my, I'd love your response, Dr. Noel, but for me, it sounds like we get into survival mode a little bit mm -hmm. that we can't really get in. If you think of polyvagal, we are not in ventral vagal, right? We're, right. And the uh, joy, it literally, the stress can suck the joy out and you mm -hmm. forget, mm -hmm. you know, you forget that. And also to things that are okay or more expendable. Mm. So, you know, I can let maybe my, you know, guitar go, because, you know, that's something that serves me, but I've really got to be over here on this because this is an emergency kind of thing. And you have to, you have to polyvagal yeah. energy. You got to recirculate that, rethink it, yeah. right? Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting that as humans, we do default to, you know, moving sometimes to a maladaptive, not life-giving experience in instead of that joyful one yet yeah, we're at fives so i can do a short version but i do in all do the short handouts. version we do have maybe like two questions to get to all right um, i'll pivot while you ask a question and i love this christy christy chatted in bobby we're only doing our supervision outside from now on <laughs> all right bobby whoever you are you're lucky you're, you just got put on blast in front of <laughs> the entire state of new york so no low stakes no pressure <laughs> all right so this is if we'll send you the handout but i use this with clients all the time i use it with kids you use it with your kids you use it with your clients but i want this today is about you using it for yourself this is the method that i developed around my book and i call it focus and the reason i chose that acronym was because in under my breath when i'm stressed i literally hold my breath and go all right jason focus and i was so aggravated with myself because i would find i was literally holding my breath during times of stress which we know as people who are trained in the techniques of stress reduction you don't hold your breath you regulate your breath right that's a common you know that's that was second nature so focus is one when you're feeling stress the F, and this is for my clients, they'll tell you the F is the one that really Fs with you. And you can insert a lot of words for that. But to be able to feel, especially, you know, a feeling of stress without judgment is a very difficult skill to master. Because we do, Tim, when we're stressed, the default to self-judgment. You know, I'm stressed out. I'm not doing good enough work. I'm not doing a good enough dad. I'm not doing a good enough, like that's the narrative that, that most humans, particularly social workers, tend to default to. But you can be, you can have a feeling without going to self-judgment. So just practice with F. If you have to put it on a sticky note and put it on your wall in front of your computer to remind you to do this, just do that for 10 days. And then I want you to just observe what the thought is. And observing thoughts is so much more than observing feeling. You have to tell yourself just because you have a thought that does not mean it's true. Let's think about that. I'm not being a good enough dad. Well, let's really think about that. I'm a social worker. So I know what low standard parenting looks like. That's my career. <laughs> you know, I'm in a career where I help people do better. Am I really a good parent? Yeah, I am. So let's just get rid of that self-judgment. Let's get rid of it because just because you have a thought 
does not mean you have to believe it. It just means it's going in and out. And that is such a difficult skill, right? And it's one we work so much with our clients on in CBT is just because that mean thought sneaks in does not mean that's a real thought. But when I have to look inside my own head, I don't, I don't want to cooperate with that. And, but if you can let the thought go and, you know, feel without judgment, then you can connect to your body and find your space. So a simple activity is, you know, Kara, if you'll help me demonstrate, find your stress point. So I'm very chest heavy. So when I'm stressed, I don't want to breathe. I just want to lock it up right here and hold everything right here. And this band of muscles gets really tight for me. So I sometimes just have to kind of connect to my myself and just kind of acknowledge that. So you may find yourself doing this. Some people do this. You may get a tense, pensive jawline. Yep. So find whatever your space is, your knees lock up, whatever it is for you, stomach starts to turn. Yep. Then give that space a little attention. Let your body know you're okay with what's going on. Loosen it up. You know, do your jaw if you have to, you know, pat yourself on your chest and just exhale. You know, so then move into breath regulation. So once you've sort of hit you, which is the in the focus is that we understand the purposeful pause. And I understand that when I'm stressed, I hold my breath and tighten up my muscles and start thinking, you know, the negative things that could happen in that situation. Or, you know, I can take a pause here, let some of that go, and then move into, instead of self-judgment, move into self-compassion, reflect on the experience, right? And then if you need to make a correction, allow yourself to correct without judgment, right? So allow yourself to go, okay, so maybe next time, you know, I'll do things a little differently, but that doesn't mean I'm not a good person, not a good social worker, not a good parent, not a good partner, not a good. So take out the not enoughness, right? So don't tell yourself that you're not doing enough, but rather acknowledge your efforts. And um, then in that space, you can do a healthy correction. Right. So it's like shaming a child is not a good behavior because that doesn't correct because the child focuses on the shame. Same rule for adults. Right. It's just usually in here. Like, so we're doing that kind of in our own heads. And I have to remember this. I always say, you know, this is very cliche, but it is kind of a daily struggle when I get stressed to remember not to go into those old unconscious default you know, you know, some of that's from our childhood, right? You know, if you had a teacher that scolded you and you felt uncomfortable in fourth grade, it could still be there somewhere, right? But what you can do is put that pause in and go, whew, my chest is tight. What's really going on with me? Not what's wrong with me, right? Because that's a different language. It's what's, what's happening here. So you're moving into that assessment language that what's happening here, what's going on in the social environment. And then maybe you can put the fix in because we're problem solvers, right? We can come up with that fix really quickly, hit that fix and maybe move on instead of you know still feeling shame three days later about something you're not really sure about, <laughs> right? But we're all human and we're all there, right? So I think part of that too is let's just stand. I'm, I have no qualms about showing up with every insecurity to say, yes, there. Yeah, I get nervous when I have a webinar. And so I was nervous this morning, um, but it's fine, right? I feel like we're checking out in a pretty good space. And I hope, Kara, that you guys, when the data comes back, if you'll ask me back, I'd love to show up again and uh, do something else. I Thank wish you. I got, I feel sad. I don't get to meet all these great social workers in the room. I know, I know. I wish I could go shake hands and I don't know what you guys were actually touching people now in Alabama. So I miss like being in front of live audience and mm. you know meeting people face to face. And mm. yes, I will share. So the PowerPoint, I don't mind sharing Kara with the understanding that it's the materials copyrighted. So you can't go and train in your organization now that you've done this. We're not certifying you. We're just, it's a very short webinar, but yeah, I'm happy to share, share the materials.
Yeah, great. Thank you so much. These are upcoming CTAC events. Um, we have dyadic developmental psychotherapy and evidence-based developmental approach to treating complex trauma and disorders of attachment. That's tomorrow. That's going to be really great. Um, we have history matters using ACEs research to conduct a family genealogy. That's next Thursday. And then we have conversations with Dr. Tony featuring Nan Henderson around resiliency in children and youth on Monday, June 27th. So join us for any of those things. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Newell. We really appreciate your participation today and all of your information.